put this DMR presentation together about uh, about two years and and it's been pieced together by, if any of you have ever been to Dayton, uh, there's a gentleman there that gives a DMR presentation every, every year named John. His call sign, I think, is W2XAB, if I remember correctly. And uh, he's done it the last four or five years, and he's, he's a member of the Motorola Amateur Radio Club. And he's up, he updates it a little bit each year. And uh, I caught his presentation in 2014, and I took pictures of all the slides, and I went home and c kind of copied the intro part of it, and I put a bunch of Texas stuff into it. And then since then, I've, I've uh, updated it several times uh, to include um, just new stuff that's come out about radios and hotspots and uh, different networks and whatnot. So. Uh, the, these two gentlemen you see down here, Kent Weeks and Larry Schaffron, are two of the hams up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that helped me put this presentation together. Larry's one of the repeater owners as well. I am, uh, I run a video podcast series on YouTube called Ham Radio 2.0 where I talk about whatever's new in amateur radio. That's my, my tagline is what is new in amateur radio. Um, so you can, my, my website address is livefromthehamshack.tv. Um, but the videos themselves live on YouTube. You can go to the website and it has a listing of all the different episodes there. I've got about 86, 87 episodes up right now. I'm recording this one because it will be an episode later on also. Somebody's talking on DMR Simplex here, so let me shut that off. Um, I also have a website, grapevineamateurradio.com, where I sell a bunch of the Chinese radios, uh, some of the DMR radios and that kind of thing. Um, if you ever have questions about DMR, I give this presentation because I like DMR. I think it's my favorite mode that's out there today. If you call me up and you say, hey, I bought my radio from somebody else, main trading company, HRO, Amazon, and you want me to help you with it, I'll help you with it because my interest is promoting DMR in the amateur radio community, especially in Texas because that's where I'm, I've lived in Texas my whole life. Um, Grapevine is, if nobody's heard of Grapevine, it's right next to DFW Airport, wedged in between Dallas and Fort Worth. So I've been in the DFW Metroplex most of my life. But that's, um, that's who I am. I've had the same call sign since 1994, too. So has anyone never heard of DMR? Okay, so everybody's heard of it. Has anyone never talked on DMR? Okay, good. All right. Has anyone ever heard of P20, who has never heard of P25? Everybody knows what P25 is. Kinda, okay. Um, this may or may not be true in the Houston area, but in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, when they're talking about all the police and fire departments going digital, um, they're all moving to P25 up there. There are some municipalities throughout, there, I know there's some in Oklahoma, and some in Central Texas that have gone to DMR rather than P25, but T P25 is another digital mode because we don't have enough digital modes around these days. So P25 is another one, mostly done by Motorola. Kenwood's got some P25 stuff. ICOM's got some P25 stuff on their commercial side. But P25 is a commercial standard. I'll mention it later on in this presentation is the reason I'm talking about it. Um, but DMR was developed by the European Telecommunication Standard Institute, so what's called an ETSI standard. And it was developed as a, as a narrowband um, spacing to accommodate for the 12 and a half kilohertz spacing that most commercial and police and fire departments have been required to go to by the FCC. It uses what's called TDMA, time division multiple access. You might recognize TDMA because you probably had a TDMA cell phone about 10 to 12 years ago. Uh, it's old cell phone technology. It is four level FSK. It does incorporate forward error correction. Um, but it is a commercial standard. DMR, unlike D-Star and unlike Fusion, DMR is a commercial standard. It was not developed for amateur radio, and neither was P25. But, like everything else, there's a bunch of hands out there who said, hey, this is cool, we could make this work for amateur radio, and that's exactly what they've done. So there are multiple systems, repeaters, radio, well, not really radios yet, Radios come, well, there, I take that back. There's one company specifically making DMR radios for amateur radio, and that's Connect Systems out of California. Other than that, everything else you see is pretty much commercialized and made for the commercial market. They all incorporate encryption and uh, scrambling and um, voice decoding and whatnot, and 
you can turn all that off because we can't. We're not supposed to use that in amateur radio, and I, I, I've never used it myself. I've never messed with encryption, but the the technology will allow you to encrypt your transmissions. Uh, I'll go through these kind of quick. Uh, there's three tiers to DMR: uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three. It's very ambiguous the way they named it. Uh, DMR tier one is basically um, some people call it DPMR. You might, you might see DPMR. It's a single time slot. It's an unlicensed spectrum. If you go to like, I don't know if they have Walmarts in the UK, but if you go buy an FRS equivalent radio in the UK and it's digital, this is what it is. Um, it's, there's no licensing required on the frequencies that most of the radios work on, and they use it overseas a lot for their family radio service equivalent of whatever they call that. It's an unlicensed spectrum. We are able to use it on amateur radio in the US, but I don't know of anybody who really does use it. Um, so if you see a radio on Amazon, eBay, something, you're like, hey, that's a good price. Make sure it's not DMR tier one standard because it will not work on our system. Our system is DMR tier two, which is a two time slot TDMA, 12 and a half kilohertz, peer to peer and repeater mode specification, resulting in 6.25 kilohertz per channel. Now. TDMA, time division multiple access, means that you can have two conversations going on at one time on the same repeater in the same frequency and they will not interfere with each other. Here's a question that came up a couple weeks ago. It has nothing to do with the bandwidth of the signal. TDMA and the 6.25 kilohertz per channel completely independent. One has nothing to do with the other. In fact, if you go read the Yezu Fusion specs, Yezu Fu Fusion, unless they're in that VW mode, which is, I call it very wide for VW. That's not what it stands for. I don't remember what it stands for, but if you're in the regular DN mode in Yezu Fusion, you're on 6.25 because 6.25 kilohertz is carrying your voice and the other 6.25 kilohertz is carrying the data traffic that you, when you talk to the other station, you see their call sign come up on your screen and how far away they are, they are from you. That's the information that's transmitted over the other half of that 12 and a half kilohertz bandwidth. DMR is the same way. It works exactly the same way. The difference between Fusion and DMR is that DMR will key up for about 33 seconds, 33 nanoseconds, I think. I always get it confused. It's either nanoseconds or microseconds. It's 1 33rd of a second. So it keys up and unkeys for 1 33rd of a second. And it keys up and it, so it keys up and unkeys 33 times per second. The human ear cannot hear that. So you never notice a break in transmission. It is com completely continu continuous, but it's doing it so fast that when it's unkeying, it keys up on this time slot and it's unkeyed on this time slot and it does this. So you've got two conversations on time slot one and time slot two going at the same time, and both of them are keying up and keying down, but you can't hear it because the human ear can't hear that quickly. That's what a TDMA transmission does, and DMR is the only one that actually has that, except for P25 phase two, which is really expensive, and you guys don't want that. So IP site connect is the protocol used over the internet to connect the repeaters together to form the network. DMR tier three is exactly the same thing, except that it incorporates trunking. Um, I don't know of any amateur radio systems that incorporate trunking. Uh, we don't really, we don't usually have wide enough bandwidth to incorporate trunking, but a lot of the commercial systems will have trunking. They'll have eight or 10 or 12 frequencies that are trunked and you can incorporate trunking into DMR and it's referred to as tier three. For all intents and purposes, DMR tier two is what you want and 90% of the radios out there are DMR tier two compliant. Uh, DMR is TDMA with four level SF FSK C4FM with an AMBE plus two codec. Now you see C4FM up there, a lot of fusion guys will call their digital mode C4FM and that's not incorrect, but it's also, also not complete because a fusion is an FDMA, four level S FSK C4FM, where DMR is TDMA. So basically the only difference between fusion and DMR is that DMR has two time slots and fusion does not. I know guys have taken those $500 Yezu repeaters and put them on the back of an MMDVM host running on a Raspberry Pi and converted their Fusion repeater into a one single time slot DMR repeater and they're talking on DMR because the vocoder chips, the AMBE plus two codec chip in each of those systems is, that, is exactly the same. So the two modes are very, very, very similar. Fusion doesn't incorporate 
two time slots, but if you listen to them, they sound incredibly similar. P25 is basically the same way. D-Star uses an AMBE with GMSK modulation, and you'll notice the plus two is missing from D-Star. That's because when D-Star was developed 10 or 15 years prior to these other modes, that was the newest codec at the time, and it had the most cutting edge technology and voice codec when it was developed, but that was, it's just, it's just been around longer than, than DMR has. Uh, P25 phase one, which is what most of the systems I'm familiar with are on, is, is very, very similar to, fu to what Fusion's using, except they use an IMBE codec. P25 phase two is basically the same thing, except they have a newer codec trip. Uh, chip, vocoder chip. Vocoder is a voice decoder and encoder chip. They call it a vocoder for a sign signifying term. Others include IDAS, which is uh, I one of ICOM's proprietary digital modes. DPMR, which we talked about a second ago, and NXDN. NXDN is Kenwood's Next Edge. If you've ever seen Kenwood, they have Next Edge radios. They have their own digital format. Um, mostly used in the commercial world, but according to repeater book, there's a couple of guys in Lufkin, Texas that are running NXDN repeaters on amateur radio frequencies. So there's something for everybody. Digital versus analog. If you guys were here for the D-Star talk, you probably heard this. It's basically the same thing. When you get to the edge of the repeater, you drop signal and you're gone. There is no static. There's no crackling. There's no you can, you can kind of be into and out of the repeater, especially if you're driving, and it will kind of, it, it'll, it'll make a noise similar, what we call it is pixelating. It's a term that we use, and it'll kind of, sometimes it'll sound like an R2-D2, sometimes it'll sound like a squeak and squawk type thing, but basically, if you had clear line of sight to the repeater, and you were to just walk or drive away from the repeater, it would come to a certain point where you would be 100% solid into the repeater and then you would just drop off. So there's no fading of signal, there's no crackling, there's no static or anything like that. But especially because the TDMA technology, the distance is limited. I think Motorola publishes that it's limited to like 85 miles before the key up, key down TDMA section really starts to lose integrity and you can't, it's basically unintelligible at that point in time. I pretty much tested that limit. The downtown Dallas repeater, I can key it from Corsicana, driving south down 45. Um, know a couple guys who keyed it from, um, where's that big flea market that's out west? Or e Canton, east rather, Canton. Yeah, you can key the Dallas DMR repeater from Canton, coming up east on 20 from, from Canton towards Dallas. So it's got a long reach to it. But sometimes you sound pixelated in the repeater because you're testing the bounds of it. Forward error, this last bullet here, forward error correction, if, if anyone's taken, has anyone taken your extra test within the last couple years? Studying for it now. Studying for it now. Forward error correction is one of your questions. What is forward error correction? What does it mean? It's used in digital modes on HF, PSK31, JT65, and all these. But forward error correction is the same thing. It's, it's a way of correcting the packets on a digital transmission further than you would without that technology being added to the system. This is just a graphical representation that I got from Kent, one of the guys I mentioned up ahead. In order to have two separate time slots or two separate frequencies talking at the same time on traditional system or a digital FDMA system, you need two repeaters with combining equipment and antenna, two different frequencies and two different repeater pairs. With TDMA, it's all on one repeater, one antenna, and the time slots, um, the two time slots don't interfere with one another. So if Hank and I were talking on time slot one, and if Philip and, where'd Russell go, wherever Russell is, is talking on time slot two, then those two, uh, conversations would be completely independent of one another and you wouldn't even in here. So a DMR repeater is two repeaters built into one. Uh, DMR will do analog, oh, DMR repeaters will do analog, but most of the networks don't allow you to connect an analog repeater. So most DMR repeaters are run digital only. Some guys on few, some guys will comment on my DMR 
episodes on YouTube and they'll be like, oh yeah, but you don't have nearly as many users as Fusion does because there's 10,000 repeaters that they sold and I don't know, 20,000 users or something like, I don't, it, those numbers are wrong, it's 120,000 users maybe. And I'm like, yeah, but all the Fusion stuff is running in mixed mode and most of it's used in analog. Digital, DMR, like DSTAR, is a digital only system. 99% of everything you're gonna see on DMR is digital only, no analog, no passing traffic in analog at all. There are different networks for DMR. Um, the first that was in the United States was DMR Mark. Mark is Motorola Amateur Radio Club. If you go to dmr-marc.net, you register your call sign and they send you a seven digit, what's called a subscriber ID. That's what you put into your radio when you're programming your code plug. It's similar to D-Star, you have to register your call sign. On a Fusion radio, when you first boot it up out of the box, you put in your call sign in the radio. We don't put our call signs into DMR radios, we put the seven digit subscriber ID, because again, it wasn't developed for amateur radio. But the DMR Mark guys came up with this system that said, hey, you know what? We're gonna have amateur radio operators, we need to assign everyone a, a certain subscriber ID so that we know who they are when they're transmitting over the network. It's free, you just go up and put in your call sign, it takes about 24, they say about 24 hours. Sometimes it's quicker, sometimes it's a little bit longer, but uh, they'll get a, get a uh, subscriber ID, put that in your code plug in your radio. I'll talk a little bit later about, about what code plugs are. And um, that's what you use when you're programming, when you're talking on the DMR network. Sometimes you'll see new guys key up and there'll be all zeros and a one at the end and somebody will say to them, yeah man, you, you missed your, you missed your subscriber ID. You need to go back in your code plug and put your subscriber ID so that we know who you are. That kind of thing. But DMR Mark is made up of all, D all Motorola repeaters. There's 10 or 11 repeaters in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. There's about five of them down here in the Houston area. There's one in College Station. There's one outside of Austin. There's four or five up and down the Panhandle starting in Lubbock and going north. There's a brand new one in San Angelo. There's five or six in the Midland Odessa area. And they're only Motorola repeaters because Motorola repeaters don't, they don't play well with others. They, they want to only talk to one another. Uh, the network on the bottom, DMR Plus, is the old Hytera network. You can have a DMR, a uh, Motorola or a Hytera repeater that talks to each other on their network. I don't know what the difference is. It's some kind of protocol they use to build the network. And the Motorola guys, obviously, they want to use Motorola stuff. And Motorola is the best, I say the best, it's the highest quality receivers you can get and the highest quality sound you can get, but it's also the highest price tag you can get. So if you're gonna buy a Motorola radio, go to eBay and buy it on eBay, make sure it's a good one, and then you have to pay for the programming software. Yes, it is better. Sometimes it's not worth the hassle. If you're in a market where you've got a lot of repeaters in the area like Dallas-Fort Worth, you don't necessarily need a Motorola, but the sound quality is better. The Brandmeister network is fairly new, at least in the US. Um, they were the first to allow, well, they weren't the first to allow, but they're the latest ones to allow hotspots. Um, a hotspot is basically a device that you will plug into your computer and or your router at home, on your home network, and it acts as what's called, what we call it is a micro repeater. So they're about three, 400 milliwatts, something like that, and you program it up, the hotspot, with a certain frequency and certain parameters for DMR, and then you put that information into your radio, and when you key up, instead of keying up a repeater, if you don't have a repeater in your area, you key up your hotspot, and it has a IP connection through the internet into the Brandmeister network. There's a lot of the talk groups that are connected between these three systems, and there's a lot of the talk groups that are not connected between these, t these three systems. So you gotta know what your, if you have a local repeater, they have repeaters on Brandmeister and they have repeaters on DMR Mark, and you got to know what repeater network or what network your repeater is on, which is not hard to find because you can find the repeater on Repeater Book, on R Finder, on the DMR Mark website, and it always has a person's call sign and usually has their email address there. But if it's not there, you can go to QRZ and get it most of the time. So you can always find these guys who are putting up these repeaters and ask them, "What's the time slot talk group assignment of your repeater?" And most of them will share it with you because if they didn't want to share it, they wouldn't be putting up a public repeater. There are some closed repeaters in DMR, but very, very, very few. 
So time slot one and time slot two, this is kind of a general rule. It doesn't really apply so much anymore. They used to use time slot one for the wider area talk groups, such as nationwide North America, worldwide, worldwide English, worldwide Spanish. And they used to use time slot two for the more localized talk groups. You can, you can get a Metroplex talk group that you, if you've got four or five repeaters in your Metroplex area, you can connect them together on one talk group so that you key up one of those repeaters and it transmits on all five or six of the repeaters in your area. We have that in Dallas-Fort Worth. Like I said, there's about 10 or 11 repeaters. So you key up one repeater, and you're talking to everybody on all of those repeaters. So it spans across the entire network. And we call that a metro talk group. You have a statewide talk group that keys up all the repeaters in the state of Texas. And then you have a North America talk group. Um, and traditionally, they were separated between time slot one and time slot two, time slot one being the wider areas, and time slot two being the more localized. But nowadays, there's been so much, so many new repeaters and so many new hams putting up repeaters that it's just kind of a free-for-all. You just kind of have to know which repeater has what assignment. But like I said, it's not hard to find that information on the Internet. I feel like I'm moving fast. Anybody have any questions? Okay, y'all stop me if you do. That's fine. Zones, this is a, this is a confusing term to some people for, for whatever reason. When you're programming your code plug you'll see zones in there. Well, the reason you have zones is because on most radios, they have a 16-channel knob on the top. They have 16 slots, and when you get to 16, you can't turn the knob any farther. But the radio will hold 1,000 channels. So how do you get 1,000 channels into 16-channel knob zone, or a 16-channel knob radio? And the answer is zones. You can separate. I usually separate my zones by repeater, especially if you're on an HT, because most of the time you're not going to be within range of a repeater for HT coverage more than one repeater. So I separate my zones by repeater. I have Dallas repeater, Denton repeater, Colleyville repeater. I have, for down here, I have the Cypress repeater, the Houston repeater, Alvin, Freeport, Spring, and one in Huffman that's not there anymore. So I have five separate zones for the repeaters down here. Uh, you can separate your, however you want. It's totally up to you. But most code plugs you see out there will have your zones separated by repeater. A color code has absolutely nothing to do, to do with red, green, or blue. A color code is what they call their digital PL tone. Um, DMR repeaters must have a PL t uh, color code programmed into it. You can't run it toneless as you can an analog repeater. You have to have color code zero through color code 15. There's 16 options. All of the repeaters in the Dallas-Fort Worth area are color code one. Most of them down here, I think, are seven. Um, most of the ones in Midland Odessa are 14. It's, it's totally up to the repeater owner. Typically, they will put it, if you want to put up a new repeater in a certain area and there's already DMR repeaters there, you'll just use the same color codes as everyone else. But the purpose of a color code is the same thing that a PL tone does on analog. If you have two, two DMR repeaters that are close together, one on this color code, one on, this, on a different color code, then there's less likelihood of them interfering with another. Do you have a question? So for receive only, you don't necessarily have to have a color code for that? No. For receive only, you do not. Access. It's just for transmission. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Code plug is a term that also confuses people because people don't know what it is, uh, or a lot of people don't know what it is. Does anyone use Chirp to program your radio? Okay. When you... Open Chirp, you put in all your information, and you save the file on your computer. That file is a code plug. A code plug is simply a file with programming information that you shoot into your radio. So when you save files in Chirp, that's a code plug. Code plug comes from an old Motorola term where they actually had a plug in the side of the radio that they had, they had to do to program it because it's part 90, and they didn't want the guys going out in the field pressing a bunch of buttons and changing settings. So you used to have an actual plug physically that you put, put into the side of the radio, and then it would allow you to program it, and they called it a code plug. And it's just a term that's stuck over the years. Um, but a code plug is just the file on your computer that you shoot into your radio to program it. Um, DMR has been around long enough in amateur radio where you could find code plugs for areas. I've got a code plug for Dallas-Fort Worth. I've got a code plug for Houston, although it hadn't been kept, kept up to date as much. A gentleman came by my table yesterday, Rick, one of the local guys, and gave me a, a listing out of all the 
Houston area repeaters with all their time slot talk group assignments. So I'm going to go back to my code plug and update it. But you can get code plugs for all the different radios from local hams. If, if you have a ham friend who's been talking, hey, you should get D into DMR. This is really fun. I've been in it for a while. You can get a code plug from him, put your subscriber ID into it, shoot it into the radio, and you're done. And then you can go into that code plug, kind of look and see how it's built, and kind of learn from there. That's how I learned how to build a code plug was I had one, somebody send me one, and then uh, I just kind of hacked it up and said, oh, I understand how it's being, being worked out now. A receive group or, or an RX group is a group of talk groups on a time slot. Now, you can have access to as many talk groups per time slot as you want to. When I say talk groups, um, talk group on DMR is the same thing as a reflector on D-Star. Uh, Fusion calls them, WiresX calls them rooms. But it's just a group of... It's, it's a channel that's usually designated by geographical location, but can be designated by club. You can have a club talk group. You can have a, a Skywarn talk group. You can have an ARRL talk group. You can, you can have whatever you want. But a talk group is just the, the most common ones are local, statewide, regional. Cactus guys have one. Simplex has a talk group of its own. Um, you, and you can have as many talk groups per time slot. I, I said earlier you have two time slots. So you can have five talk groups that are allowable on time slot one and 25 that are allowable on time slot two or however many you want. But you can only use one at a time. You can only transmit on one at a time. You may have access to all these other ones, but if someone's using the repeater and talking on a certain talk group, you can't key up on that repeater and talk on another talk group that belongs to this time slot. You can do it on this time slot, but not this one. So they come up with this idea of receive groups to where you can put all the groups that are in a certain time slot into your code plug so that, you, so that when there's activity on your repeater on time slot two or on time slot one, you will hear it no matter what channel your radio is sitting on. So you can always hear the activity and then you can say, oh, these guys are talking on statewide, so you turn your knob to statewide, you wait for a break in the conversation, you key up and you join in. It also keeps you from stepping on people or taking over the repeater in the middle of a conversation if you're listening to a certain channel and you don't hear any activity and you key up but somebody's talking on another talk group you're not monitoring then you're going to interrupt their conversation so the receive group was created so that there wouldn't be conversation interrupting while the repeater was in use a lot of people ask about simplex and dmr because they think you have to be on a repeater to talk on DMR, and you don't. We talk on Simplex all the time. I've been talking on to guys here locally on Simplex. Um, we typically, <coughs> we have, uh, let's see, we have, these are the, quote, standard accepted frequencies for Simplex that the DMR Mark Association came up with and most people adhere to. I mean, if you want to travel somewhere and talk to somebody on Simplex that you don't know and just kind of meet people on ham radio, these are the frequencies you would listen to. The uh, programming information down at the bottom is talk group 99, color code 1, and time slot 1. Uh, if you go to Dayton, you have these. My, my radio is UHF only. All, all the radios in DMR right now are mono band. They've got some dual band stuff coming out next month, finally. But right now, they're all mono band. So if you take those four UHF frequencies and go to Dayton in May, you're going to hear people all over those frequencies all weekend long. Just blah, 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 blah. So a lot of simplex operation in larger ham fests. I was in Orlando last month, same thing. Wasn't as much activity in Orlando, but there was people out there talking on DMR simplex. Uh, Fusion, D-Star simplex, I think they, they all use the same thing. or Not the same frequencies, but when they meet together at a ham fest, they use simplex a lot because there's, sometimes there's a repeater in the area, but sometimes you just don't want to be on the repeater. Uh, the DMR Mark network is uh, made up of C bridges, and a C bridge is basically the gateway between the repeater and the internet. Uh, Brandmeister doesn't use C bridges; they use a they use what's called a master server, which is just a server located somewhere that connects the repeater to the rest of the network. Um, so a C bridge, or bridging hardware, basically 
when you do when you go program your repeater, all you put into your repeater is an IP address and a port number. And you put your frequency information in there. But if I want certain talk groups and time slots, I don't program those into my repeater. I program them into the Seabridge software. So there's a guy in College Station that runs the Texas Seabridge. There's another guy up in uh, Fort Worth area that runs the Armadillo Seabridge. And then there's a Brandmeister master server somewhere. There's one in Texas. I can't remember where it is right now. Uh, but you will put in that information and then the, either the master server on Brandmeister or the Seabridge on DMR Mark is what allows the certain talk groups and time slots to go to your repeater. This is one of the things why I like DMR better than the other digital modes. Um, because of what I said earlier, it's an Etsy standard that is a worldwide standard open source platform. At last count, there were about 41 manufacturers worldwide making DMR radios. Not limited to ICOM, you're not limited to Yezu. Uh, in fact, ICOM is a member of the DMR association. They don't make DMR radios, but they are a member of the association. JVC Kenwood, Kenwood's been making DMR radios out in the UK for two or three years. They're finally starting to come to the United States. But you'll recognize some of the names up there, Motorola, Hytera, uh, Connect Systems is up there, Vertex Standard. Uh, some, of those, some of these companies are out of China, but some of them are out of Spain. There's one in Italy. There's, um, a, couple in, there's a couple in Japan and that kind of thing. So it really is a worldwide standard. Yes. Have you seen the Texas radio company Mobile Trading? Yes. Who's Texas Radio Company? Main trading company. Okay, so it's rebranded. Yes. Okay. Yeah. He contacted somebody overseas and he says, I want a DMR radio of my own. They're like, okay. okay. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know why he did that, why he put a different name on it, but he's like, because I, I had people ask me about it, so I went to him earlier. I was like, can I tell people you're making it? He's like, yeah, tell them. Okay, good. It's Richard's radio. <laughs> So, but <coughs> the one in the top left corner there is the CS800 radio. That's the Connect Systems. Texas Digital Radio looks just like that, except it actually has TDR6100 on the front. Basically the same radio. That's been the most popular mobile radio in amateur radio for the last two or three years because it's the best price. You get, you get the Connect System CS800 brand new for 280 bucks. Um, holds about... With the firm, this is, and, and again, I said earlier, Connect Systems actually makes DMR radios for, for amateur radio specifically. There's about, I told you about the subscriber ID database, there's about, at last count, just, just over 50,000, 52, 54,000, somewhere in there, digital subscriber IDs in that database worldwide. Most of these radios only hold 1,000 IDs because, again, it's a commercial standard. Most police departments don't have more than 1,000 people or companies in a big building that want to use DMR, they don't have more than 1,000. So most of the radios only hold 1,000 subscriber IDs so that when you key up and you and I are on the same repeater and I hear the repeater go off, I can look down at my screen and I can see your subscriber ID with your call sign next to it. The Connect Systems radio will hold about 65,000 contacts and about 2,000 channels. So they have firmware on their radio that makes it more compatible with the amateur radio systems. That one in the middle is the uh, TYT Titera MD380. That's been the most popular HT in amateur radio simply because of the price point. It's about 100 bucks. Uh, some hams have hacked it and, and put on a, a firmware called MD380 Tools that will give you a lot more enhanced features. Um, it'll hold the entire database in it. The TYT radio by default only holds a thousand channels, but with the hacked MD380 tools firmware that was made by HAMS, for HAMS, it'll hold the entire DMR Mark database in there as well. And it's got some other cool features to it. Uh, they've got a booth, what building are we in, D? They've got a booth in Building C over there, the Houston Digital Radio Group, and they are loading code plugs and firmware onto that radio and a couple other radios for people at the show this weekend. These are a couple of the Motorola radios that were the first ones out that Ham started buying off of eBay before everybody else was making them. This is the new DV4 Mobile. 
this will be, this is a company out of Florida called Wireless Holdings. That the guys are German. They, they speak with pretty thick German accents, but they actually live in Florida. They are citizens of the US. And I've, I've met these guys at Dayton last year, and I met them again at, I uh, did an interview with them at Orlando last month. Uh, this radio, when it releases, it was supposed to be out by now. It's been delayed, like most things in radio today. Um, they're hoping to have it by Dayton of this year. This radio will be tri-band. It'll do 2 meters, 220, and 440. It'll do D-Star, DMR, Fusion, Kenwood, Next Edge, NXDN, and eventually it will do P25. They're having some licensing issues with P25 right now, but it'll do tri-band, all-mode digital. They're planning on doing the next, once they get this out rolling, get some firmware updates to it, they want to do another one that has 900 megahertz and 1.2 gigahertz. And then they want to do an HF all mode, uh, six meter HF. And then you'll have three radios stacked like this that'll be every band for amateur radio and every mode for amateur radio. That's their focus. Probably a few years before you see that. But that's a really cool looking radio. They had some demos going in Orlando last month of guys talking on the Fusion repeater and it was you, you were able to listen to it. It's gonna be a really cool radio once it finally comes out. Yes, it does do analog. Uh-huh. Analog. Yeah. Oh, analog. What, what is that again? What's the price point of that radio? It's about a grand. Yeah. Yeah. So, 1,000 to 1,200 roughly, something like that. But if you go buy a mobile radio for Fusion and want to pay Yezu for their brainchild, uh, tri-band analog radio, about 300 bucks. Uh, mobile uh, DMR radio is about 300 bucks. So for what it is, it's, it's actually pretty good in the package. Yes, it will do analog. Uh, the 220 side, I'm really big into 220. 220 is what I, the, most of the time when I'm on analog back home, I talk on 220. There's a lot of up and coming 220 activity in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. And you guys have some good repeaters down here as well. Um, <coughs> but it'll do 220 analog. There's no 220 DMR or fusion repeaters out there right now. They are making a 220D star repeater though. So uh, that's my website at the top with my video series. The DMR Mark net is where you would register for your subscriber ID. Uh, Turbo.org forward slash talk groups has a really good listing of talk groups. I should put the hose line website on here, but I, I don't have that up there. There's a website, if you go Google Brandmeister hose line, there's a website out there where you can go open your web browser, and you can actually listen to talk groups transmissions on the internet. You can't key up, but you can listen to see who's talking. It shows, it pulls in their QRZ information, so it shows their picture and their call sign when they're talking. So it's a really cool website that the Brandmaster guys developed called Hoseline. That is it. Any questions? Then the worst that could happen In a blink of an eye Life in heat is ham shack and all his gear got fried, he was at China Buffet when his...